everyone. Hi guys, welcome back. This is module CM4269, Green and Sustainable Chemistry. And this is the second part of the uh, industrial waste uh, lecture, waste treatment lecture. And we finished the liquids now, so we're going to start on the gases. Uh, this first slide is uh, normally I show this for energy resources. It's an artist impression of a, uh, a future power station powered by biomass and Teesside. Now, in that module, we would normally be talking about not can we do it? Yes, we have got the technology to do this, but should we? About the calorific value of the potential fuel, where the fuel is, how you get it there, rah, 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 rah. I've not put that here today for that reason. The reason I've put this here is that this designer power station actually has very, very low emissions. Um, for the rest of this lecture, I take you back to the opening slide of this, of the first part of this lecture with um, the cotton power station. That's the sort of situation we're talking about now rather than something modern like this. Okay, though, let's talk uh, a bit about what comes out of uh, such power stations. Uh, let's talk a little bit about air quality. Now, there are two types of sources. Um, one are called stationary sources. That's the power stations, the factories, the things that don't move. And surprise, surprise, the other type are called mobile sources, principally transport based cars, ships, etc, etc. Now, the different types of source have different types of emissions. So for stationary, you've got particulate matter, you've got nitrogen oxides and you've got carbon dioxide um, exactly the same as the mobile ones but the stationary uh, sources have more sulfur dioxide principally because the fuels they use coal and in some case cases bunker oil uh, they have larger amounts of sulfur in them than the highly refined fuels that are used with mobile sources so that's why stationary sources have sulfur dioxide and modern mobile sources don't or have it to a much lower degree. And mobile sources uh, don't have sulfur dioxide but do have VOCs and carbon monoxide. Effectively unburnt fuel and uh, low oxygen combustion fuel products. The stationary sources, basically you've got full combustion so you don't really get much CO and VOCs, but mobile sources, as we'll see, the emissions depend on uh, the mixture and the state of the engine, so you do get these other two types of pollutant. Just to, uh, this is from the UK, to give you a, an example of the difference between these two sources. So typically, the mobile to stationary ratio for PM10 is about two to three. For NOx, the same ratio is about seven to five. So there are differences between the different types of source and it's worth bearing that in mind. Anyhow, why particularly should these things worry us? Um, this is a, uh, a diagram from the Air Quality in Europe report 2013. It's available on the Europa site, which is the European Environment Agency site. And it's a little sketch diagram of how different uh, pollutants, air quality, affect different parts of the body. So you've got headaches, central nervous systems, you've got eyes, nose, throat, lungs, you name it, even down to reproductive system. And PM, particulate matter, is implemented in very many of them. Now, start from the beginning, I suppose. Why are we interested in emissions? Well, particulate matter is pretty bad for us. Um, there are a number of roots 
if you like, if you think of um, uh, the way things get into our body, the lungs is one of those bodies, or one of those roots in. So small particles get more deeply into the lungs and they're more efficient at um, giving us whatever is on those particles. If it's an asthma inhaler, it's great. It's the drugs you need straight in. If it's um, a carcinogenic PAH or a, um, a very acidic particle from air pollution, then great. It's straight in as well. And without being boring, I was always puzzled how air quality could produce anything except um, respiratory issues. But actually, it turns out that these small particles in the lungs scar the lungs and damage them at the fine level. And that can um, lead the lungs to producing various chemicals, uh, uh, sort of um, steroids and other things, which actually put the body more on a war footing. Blood pressure goes up, arteries um, contract. And what that does is if you have any latent or potential heart condition it can push that over the edge and you can end up with a, a cardio infarction infarction sorry a heart attack so that's one story there are many stories i don't intend to go through them or hear uh, the other issue about pollutants is there's two types of pollutants there are threshold pollutants or poisons we should say and non-threshold poisons so threshold poisons typically below a certain level the threshold um, the uh, dose response curve shows no effect of that um, exposure and you don't carry any effects forward but some pollutants radioactivity is a good example and possibly pm 2.5 maybe another example and would it's a particular size of particulate matter we'll talk about it in a minute for radioactivity at any rate every little dose of radioactivity you get adds up which is why your doctor or your dentist when they give you an x-ray has a large lead apron or leaves the room because for you it's only one dental x-ray for them it's potentially many hundreds a day and the cumulative dose could have serious effects on their reproductive systems. So two types of pollutant, one much worse, the non-threshold, much worse in terms of human health than the threshold. So I'd like to draw your attention to this text from the European Environment Agency. And I'll let you read it. This is extremely bad news and extremely worrying for air quality or rather for air pollutants okay um, I could have given many articles but basically the tiny particles kill you um, if you think of an asthma inhaler we were just talking about it takes drugs deep down into the OVI, the very small areas, the uh, bloodstream lung boundary. But for air quality, <laughs> you breathe in on these small particles and whatever dose of goodies, in inverted commas, black humour, that particle is carrying will probably determine the harm that it does to you. And um, that's why we're concerned about emissions into air, air pollutants. Okay, so now let's look at the techniques or the technology we have to clean up uh, end of pipe type approach to uh, emissions from stationary sources and emissions from mobile sources. Um, we're not going to do a comprehensive job here. Uh, for the stationary sources, not 
not bad actually we've covered most of the bases for mobile sources I'm really just going to look at one type of catalytic converter but give you history on the, uh, the development and then finally simply because for reasons of completeness really we're going to do a little bit of um, uh, modeling is I suppose the right word for it um, to show you the way that one assesses whether there's going to be a problem or not um, in any particular given area. Okay. So we'll start with stationary sources and we'll start with electrostatic precipitators. What are they? Well, here we have a little schematic diagram. Uh, the uh, emission stream, the waste stream, which in this case is gaseous with particles. Um, the precipitator removes the uh, particles from the stream, so you have many fewer particles. Now, we've just been thinking about <coughs> how, uh, what the health impacts of particulates, particularly small particulates, are. So, to remove them is a very, very uh, good idea. Um, we'll look at uh, the detail of a precipitator in the next slide, but let's think about how they work. What they do is they have a, a very, very high voltage difference, plates with very high voltage between them, such that corona discharge happens and the plates are always negatively charged. Um, there is uh, ionization uh, taking place on the particles, so they become charged and then move toward the, uh, the plate. And the uh, polarity difference, positive particles, negative plate, hold these particles on the plate. Efficiencies are typically huge, 99.9% .9 is a reasonable efficiency. Now, we might in our heads want to compare this to filtration. You couldn't get that efficiency anyway, but remember, you're not pumping this. This is, um, we'll talk about this a bit later, this effluent is rising up a chimney and it's just the temperature of that plume which gives it its rise velocity. The energy you require for filtration is massive because you have to move all of the air, including the particles, and then you collect the particles on a filter and have to push the air through the filter. The energy requirements for electrostatic precipitation is negligible in relation because the only energy you're using is to move the tiny number, the tiny particles um, from wherever they are in the stream to the plate. Um, so there are significant advantages to electrostatic precipitators, both in terms of their function and the energy it takes to run them. Uh, the way these things work is the, the plate um, gradually picks up more and more, uh, more and more particles and there's a vibration cycle so the the particles are vibrated off and then collected in a in dust sacks uh, around. Anyway, let's now look at a, a diagram of what one of these things look like uh, more in real life. So this is the baby. These are the dust handling sacks underneath and you have many, many collecting plates and the wires are the discharge electrodes where you get the corona discharge. So, you have your uh, gaseous stream, your, um, your effluent stream coming through this housing. The particles are sticking on the collecting plates which are vibrating and the dust then ends up down here. The discharge goes through and of course goes in 
with particulates and comes out effectively without particulates. The whole system is automatic. The dust bags are uh, changed. Um, that there are a number of models that can be changed automatically or you can change them manually. But this singular piece of kit is one of the things which has revolutionized or massively reduced the um, discharges from stationary sources. Unfortunately, it's really quite difficult to make an efficient one of these babies of an appropriate size uh, for mobile sources. Okay, so that's the system for particulates. Now let's think of the system for uh, gases. Um, this type of system is usually called a scrubber. And effectively, it works by contacting the target gases and particulate matter with a solution. It's called the scrubbing solution. Solutions may be, if you're just going for dust, water, although you probably use an electrostatic precipitator, as they're slightly more efficient for, uh, quite a lot more efficient uh, for particulates than scrubbing systems. Or you might uh, make it be a more, um, have a more particular target in mind. So for instance, for um, flue gas desulfurization, for sulfur, you will probably use a calcium carbonate type system, a calcium hydroxide system. Um, for uh, if you're interested in carbon dioxide, you'll probably use an ethanolamine solution. Uh, so you tailor your um, solution as to what you are trying to uh, get out of the stream. Now, if you're talking about coal power, power stations, um, mercury is a major component of the coal and you really want that gone. So you would introduce a halogen into the scrubbing chamber to actually precipitate the mercury and then remove that with whatever else you're taking out, probably sulfur. All right, let's actually have a look at the diagram, a uh, schematic diagram. And so this scrubber is for sulfur dioxide, so you can imagine it's um, uh, effectively on a, maybe a coal-fired power station or an oil-fired power station. And we have the boilers and we have the hot gases being wafted into the, uh, effectively, the exchanger. Uh, in here, you've got uh, water loaded with um, limestone. So basically you produce a limestone uh, slurry in here, which is then sprayed down so that the gas has to pass through this droplet, spray droplets, uh, where the sulfur dioxide is absorbed and captured. Um, you've also got halogens in there, so the mercury too is captured and ends up at the bottom of the exchanger. Uh, effectively, if you think about limestone is calcium carbonate plus sulfur dioxide, you're going to end up with um, calcium sulfate or gypsum and you have a, a pump which takes that out, filters the solids out and recycles and then the wastewater is recycled back through the system to be re-slurried and uh, carry on working. Your cleaned emissions meanwhile, um, without the sulfur dioxide and without the mercury, then get discharged up the chimney. And of course, the uh, gypsum is a product that can be sold in its own right. So, okay. A question for you thinking chemists. So we have gypsum and in there is also the mercury. Where does the mercury go? 
The answer, of course, is it goes nowhere at all. It's in the gypsum. But the amount of mercury is very small with respect to the amount of gypsum. So the actual mercury levels in the product are very low. But uh, nonetheless, it, it's, it's still in here. OK, <clears throat> so that's wet scrubbing. And that's very widely used uh, in power stations and in industrial applications. In industrial applications, they often have, um, if you like, designer uh, scrubbing liquids, which are designed to scrub the, the material, the, the compound or the component that they're trying to get out of the exhaust plume. The other type of scrubber is a dry scrubber. So whereas with um, uh, the example before you had a liquid, now you have a dry sorbent injection system. Um, it's mostly for acid gases, so often they'll use hydrated lime. Um, and it's good for odours as well. Um, often the uh, system, the particles are activated carbon or coated aluminium. Um, because it's good for odours, there is a particular version of this technology that's used in sewage plants, simply because if the balance is not quite right, they can be very odorous. And so dry scrubbers are very frequently used for their odour reduction ability, uh, as well as anything else. OK, so it's um, similar as before and we can stick with an acid gas because that's what uh, uh, this system is uh, good for. So here's a schematic diagram of now a dry scrubber and you can see basically you've got your flue gas being uh, uh, coming in at the top of the hopper. You have your uh, lime slurry and dry uh, powder coming down here and being absorbed uh, in the, uh, the sulfur dioxide being absorbed on the particles. It gets pumped through into a bag house, some of it drops out there, into a ash silo where it goes to landfill. And of course, by this time, the electrostatic precipitator has taken all of these particles out. So uh, your emission is again um, sulfur dioxide free. OK. I think broadly we've done for stationary sources. Um, the technology is reasonably straightforward and it falls into the two two groups of particulates, electrostatic precipitators, and gases, um, uh, scrubbers, either wet or dry. So now we go to maybe the more interesting one, which is the cleanup of mobile sources. Now, we're basically talking about vehicles, and there are two broad approaches to reducing emissions. The more green, if you like, that is the more the approach more consistent with green chemistry is actually engine redesign, lean burn engines, because you avoid a lot of the emissions in the first place. The second, which is more of an end of pipe solution, are catalytic converters. Now, if we turn the clock back 20 years or 30 years, um, a number of major car manufacturers, well, almost all car manufacturers, came to this decision that engine design was the better way around. But they needed solutions more quickly because engine design isn't a three month or six month project. Engines in current cars have been being developed for maybe 30 or 40 years. It's a long haul. So most car manufacturers went for catalytic converters because they were the easiest, the cheapest and the quickest fix. However, now in 2015, there are a number of good 
lean burn engines on the market and more coming on. So um, catalytic converters on the other hand are expensive to make and add cost to the car. So it's interesting that although catalytic converters are they are the single probably invention that has revolutionized urban air quality. Um, they are probably, they have a more limited lifetime now because most, most major companies have lean burn engines uh, at least on the drawing board, if not actually on the market. Now, a catalytic converter is not a catalytic converter is not a catalytic converter. There are one, two, three-way converters. The converters for diesels are different from petrol, rada, rada, rada. Um, we're going to look at uh, the probably the most effective catalytic converter for petrols, which is the three-way uh, converter. Um, We'll look at some history of converters as well, and you'll see some of the other types sitting in there which were more or less effective at their time. A three-way converter requires intelligence in the engine, which means for a three-way to convert converter to work properly, and in fact actually for a lean burn engine, which is the alternative to work properly, you need uh, some computer processing power in the car, because um, it's not quite fly-by-wire like a fighter. You're probably aware that modern fighters cannot be flown by people on their own. Uh, there's too many tiny modifications that have to be made to stop the thing dropping out of the sky. And they're termed fly-by-wire. Now, catalytic converters are not quite fly-by-wire, but the driver is entirely unaware of the processes that are going on to keep that catalytic converter working. Anyway, um, specialist reference by Heck here um, on IVLE, and uh, uh, I'm just going to summarize how they work and the chemistry behind them. Right, where have we gone? There we go. So, what pollutants are we concerned with? Well, you're burning hydrocarbons in air. Now, you're focused on the carbon, obviously. Carbon dioxide and water, or if there's not enough air, then you might get carbon monoxide and some unburnt hydrocarbons. But you're also, air is 78% nitrogen. So you're also getting oxides of nitrogen. Now, a bit of chemistry here. Um, nitrogen plus oxygen at high temperature, typically many hundreds, maybe even a thousand degrees centigrade. Um, you get nitrogen oxide NO formed. You do not, at that temperature, get NO2 formed. There is an equilibrium here, um, which means that nitrogen dioxide, sorry, nitrogen oxide is what comes out of the cylinder. Nitrogen dioxide is what you measure in the urban air. You measure a little bit in the exhaust plume, um, but most of what comes out of the end of the exhaust is still nitrogen oxide. It's a temperature dependent equilibrium. So um, effectively, uh, it is a secondary pollutant. So all of the boxes in red here are primary pollutants, things that come out of internal combustion engines. You've got particulate matter PM at various sizes, 0 0.1, 2 0.5 and 10. And the ones you worry about clearly, well, you worry about all of them actually, and you want to reduce all of them. But the smaller the particle size, the more dangerous they are and the longer they stay in the atmosphere for that matter. What are the other primary emissions? Sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, hydrocarbons, carbon dioxide, and NO. And for some reason we have hydrocarbons twice, we might call them VOCs, volatile organic carbon. What are the secondary pollutants? 
The other things that do you damage but don't actually come out of the car but are the primary pollutants are acted on by chemical and photochemical processes to produce secondary pollutants. Nitrogen dioxide is a secondary pollutant. Ozone is a secondary pollutant. And a whole range of things which I've just used peroxyacetyl nitric acid as an example. But a whole range of um, acetyl and organic nitrate compounds um, as part of the uh, photochemical type urban air quality smog uh, chemistry, which I'm not going to go into further here. To give you an idea about the amounts of emissions uh, that we are uh, potentially talking about, <coughs> um, probably um, carbon monoxide, a gram per kilometre, um, unburnt hydrocarbons, maybe 0.1 grams per kilometre, and NOx, oxides of nitrogen, about maybe 0.08 grams per kilometre. That's UK data, but it's uh, a reasonable estimate. Okay, so in overview, what do these catalytic converters do? Well, they convert oxides of nitrogen to nitrogen and oxygen which is uh, which is fine they take hydrocarbons and they if you like complete the combustion they form carbon dioxide and they form water and they oxidize carbon dioxide sorry carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide so effectively they do reverse combustion on nitrogen and complete the combustion on the hydrocarbons and the carbon monoxide. And as I said before, this device is single-handedly responsible for the urban air quality improvement around the world. Probably it might be quite interesting, or you might be quite interested in this next diagram. The World Health Organization um, air quality guideline for, in this case, uh, uh, PM 2.5, sorry, PM 10, is described by this heavy bottom line here. And the PM 10 concentrations in micrograms per cubic meter are running up the side. Now, transport is pretty much the main source of particulates in cities and this is I've lifted this from Hester and Harrison's book air quality in urban environments a very nice little book I recommend it to you uh, and what's happened here is cities have been organized in terms of their continent and then in terms of um, their annual average PM10 concentrations which is what these are. Now, I suppose there are two or three points to make here. The first is, um, where are most of the high numbers? They're going to be in the, the places that either have very little air quality or air quality enforcement machinery or air quality standards or in uh, cities which are in the poorer areas of the world where people can't actually afford to um, clean up their exhaust and as you can see some very high numbers in Asia in the Asian mega cities Singapore is not here um, but Singapore is uh, down here on a level with Tokyo and even Tokyo very modern city very high-tech is not has not got its uh, particulate emissions down below the World Health Organization guide limit because there are so many cars uh, the same story is true in Latin America again in the mega cities very high numbers. In some of the uh, smaller 
more modern cities where you either have less cars or you have greater wealth, then you get these numbers down. Uh, and again, it's clear that Europe and the US are generally lower than Asia and Latin America and Africa for, for the sorts of reasons that we've talked about. Um, the World Health Organization limit or guide limit here um, is uh, the lowest concentration at which lung cancer and um, cardiopulmonary mortality has been shown to increase with a 95% confidence interval. And that's long term exposure. Uh, it's also interesting to think that air, urban areas are the place where we get the worst air quality. And now, since the last five or six years in the world, more people live in cities than out of them. So it's a continuing problem. So how do these catalytic converters work and what, how are they structured? Effectively, they're a complex catalyst. You have a, a ceramic monolith porous support silicon, aluminium, magnesium oxides with 100 angstrom pores. Now, you have an active catalyst in this support, platinum, palladium and rhodium, less than two grams in a given catalytic converter. And you have a wash coat where the loaded, the platinum, palladium, rhodium is loaded onto the uh, ceramic and the ceramic is actually dipped and uh, fired. And that wash coat contains zirconium, cerium and aluminium oxides. It's very high surface area and the distribution of active sites is pretty uniform. And it acts as oxygen storage. We'll look at the moment in uh, the chemistry, but you remember that the nitrogen oxides were effectively unburnt to produce nitrogen and oxygen. And the carbon, the carbon monoxides and the VOCs were effectively completely burnt to produce carbon dioxide and water. Now, <laughs> unfortunately, those reactions require exactly opposite conditions. Um, so the, the whole lot is obviously in a steel housing and the active catalysts that remove the hydrocarbons are the platinum and the palladium and the carbon monoxide uh, hydrocarbons carbon monoxide released by platinum and palladium so that these burn these to give carbon dioxide and water the rhodium removes the oxides of nitrogen and the wash coat is an oxygen reservoir where that oxygen is stored as you'll see there are two phases and the oxygen is needed in one of them okay let's look uh, in a bit more detail at the chemistry so uh, this is the chemistry that goes on in catalytic converters and we'll see in a minute that the actual products depend on the fuel air ratio so effectively we have NO being uh, uncombusted to NO2 and carbon monoxide going to carbon dioxide, the chemistry that we have uh, just talked about. And obviously because the engine, uh, the temperature in the cylinder is much greater than the temperature in the exhaust, some of this NO has already gone to NO2. So the um, rhodium catalyst actually takes out the NO and the NO2. Uh, as here. Now, this fuel air ratio, when the fuel is lean, that is when there's very, uh, there's less oxygen, the rhodium is reducing the NOx, that's the NO and the NO2, and the oxygen it removes from this reaction and that reaction is actually stored in the wash coat as oxygen. Um, and then when the um, when the engine is running uh, more evenly, then the 
hydrocarbon and carbon monoxide oxidations occur on the platinum palladium and they use the oxygen if you look at the chemistry you need oxygen for these to actually do the oxidation they take that oxygen from the wash coat from the wash coat the catalyst capacity is such that the wash coat stores the oxygen and any other reactants it needs in lean conditions uh, to prepare for the rich conditions because the rich conditions are where you have unburnt fuel and therefore uh, you, that's when you need the hydrocarbon oxidation and as I said before the driver doesn't control this the aging of the catalysts uh, and the catalyst converter is actually due to loss of wash coat because if you lose half of this recipe the oxygen store um, then actually the efficiency of the converter uh, falls. Let's now look at a, a diagram of the converter and here you go. Here you've got the ceramic honeycomb and it's got the catalyst inside. Obviously you've got the steel and the insulation and stuff like that. You've got a, a, a wash coat uh, which is actually uh, on the uh, on the top of this um, and you have various insulating mats and, and housing but that's what it looks like it actually looks like a honeycomb and inlet outlet um, I keep talking about the um, mix uh, the fuel mix so this is a, a diagram from again Heck and Co um, it shows you the way that the different um, products move in either rich or lean mixtures. Now I should define some of the axes here. So the bottom is the air to fuel ratio. So the higher the air to fuel ratio, then the leaner it gets. The lower the air to fuel ratio, the richer it gets. On the left hand axis, you've got carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide and oxygen at the percent volume levels. So these are percent volume. On the right hand side you've got NO and hydrocarbons uh, counted as or calculated as C6 hydrocarbons and the NO is at 10 to the, this scale is um, 12 times 10 to the minus 3 ppm so there's not very much there and the hydrocarbon on the same scale uh, is actually as carbon as um, uh, C6 is 10 to the minus 2 so this is 12 times 10 to the minus 2 ppm as hydrocarbon or 12 times 10 to the minus 3 ppm as NO on this axis okay now for these converters to work they actually have to be warm and although I don't own I've never owned a car with a catalyst uh, when you start these cars up in the cab uh, there's a light and um, whilst that light is on the converter is cold and is actually not functioning um, so basically you have a once you've started the car the red light comes on and the temp the exhaust and an electric heater heats up the catalyst until the so-called light off stage where the light goes off at that point the catalyst is warm enough to start to work and the first part of the function is that the um, uh, carbon and water, the carbon uh, monoxide uh, oxidizes and water, using water, oxidizes to give the carbon dioxide and hydrogen. Note, remember the water gas reaction. And it gives hydrogen. Then, second up is the hydrocarbons begin to get oxidized. And then finally, you get the rhodium with the nitrogen oxide being reduced back to nitrogen, the nitrogen dioxide being reduced. So it's a sequential thing depending on temperature. Okay, um, let's look at a brief 
uh, getting close to the end now, a brief close, uh, brief look at the history of catalytic converters. And effectively, in 1976, the catalytic converters were single chamber. Again, a platinum-based catalyst on aluminium, and it oxidised. It was an oxidation catalyst, oxidised hydrocarbons and carbon dioxide. And look back on your oxidation catalyst notes from that session. Uh, about one gram of catalyst. In 1972, uh, it was a mixed catalyst, platinum and rhodium, with uh, cerium-based oxygen storage, and it could do um, all these three. It was a three-way catalyst, uh, lean nitrogen dioxide burn, and uh, and they used car oxygen injection or operated at stoichiometric. So there wasn't very much intelligence in the car. There was some, but uh, you had to manually inject oxygen. It wasn't clever enough to store its own oxygen. In 86, uh, a little bit more rare earth, but actually... Um, a more stable system. So cerium stabilized with zirconium. The cerium in the uh, earlier was lost quite quickly, so the converter needed to be replaced more frequently. More stable now with, again, uh, platinum rhodium, palladium rhodium, and platinum rhodium palladium complex catalyst set. Could still do all three. It was still a three-way catalyst. Um, but faster, and you got more intelligence, so fuel was being shut off during deceleration. You were maintaining oxidizing conditions for more of your journey, and the whole engine timing is now controlled by a computer with auto spark retard and things like that. Ten years further on, <laughs> the amount of catalyst is increasing yet further. Um, you've still got your cerium uh, cerium stabilized with uh, zirconium and now you have uh, a layered palladium catalyst um, so that's now uh, 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 more functional more compact more useful you've got the same functionality that you had but you've now got full control of your oxidizing and reducing conditions in the catalyst the catalyst is also hotter it's running much nearer the manifold. The manifold is the hot bit where you get all the exhaust fumes coming out. And um, so your catalysts here now are running at a, a much higher temperature and um, much more efficient. 2005, a question mark, because this table was drawn up in 2002. Um, basically, with or without cerium, um, much more closely coupled, three-way for NOx, and uh, this is now tied to the European Euro standards. Um, and we have now moved uh, to this level where you effectively have, uh, you work on the NOx because you can deal with the carbon monoxide and the hydrocarbons effectively um, with very little trouble. And this is a good demonstration of the effectiveness of regulatory pressure on technology. If you have to develop the technology, you may have to throw money at it, but you usually can. OK, we're getting towards the end. Um, where I'm going to go now is effectively a little bit about, not desperately essential for this, mod this lecture, but a little bit about how we model pollution in the urban atmosphere. Now, the whole area is called plume dispersion modelling, and effectively we're using Gaussian models, and they're a quick fix. So if this is your stationary source at the moment, and you have your plume coming out, you assume things like X, Y, Z uh, uh, diffusion, um, and usually your uh, Y and Z diffusion across the plume you assume is constant and your X diffusion uh, which you can estimate from plume velocity uh, is what it is. Um, 
If you have knowledge to the contrary, then fine, you can plug it in. There are two methods. You can either do direction from a center, or you can, uh, from the beam, so this could be the center of a square grid, and you can model it that way, or it can be the center of a, a concentric circle, grid is the wrong term for it, uh, and you can model it that way. It's good for long-term average ground level concentrations, and each square or circle in the grid uh, has its own, you can put your own sources in there, and the models will give you ground level concentrations or ground level deposition. Okay, that's the, the basics of this. Um, it's actually based on the uh, 1968 ASME guidance, which I actually have, because I, I do plume dispersion modeling. It's not the most readable document, but everything else basically references it and uses it. Um, a nice section here on Peter Brimblecombe's book, Air Composition and Chemistry. I'd recommend that book for any study of atmosphere, but uh, these figures are actually stolen from that book. I didn't draw any of them though. Some of his figures I actually drew because I, he was my first postdoc supervisor. Okay, um, this is detail we don't need at this level in this lecture, but there are various methods for, uh, if you look at plumes, they don't always uh, do that, they sometimes do that or do that. All of these are representative of different meteorology, different temperatures of the stack fluid versus the atmosphere fluid it's going into, and stack height. Not interested in this lecture, but if you're doing this sort of stuff, you need to know uh, this material fairly well. Again, you don't need this. This happens to be the grid plume dispersion equation. Um, you calculate this for every grid square, or this is the concentric circle version of the same equation. Uh, you calculate this in every direction on the circular contours. I won't worry too much about uh, this stuff. You don't really need it, uh, but this is an Excel job. Um, it's easy on Excel. You simply need to get the formulas in the cells and decide on uh, the how big your grid is, how big your cell uh, sizes are, and actually it comes out a treat. In fact, I just realized, I think you've done a m workshop on this, so that shouldn't be too alien. Um, yeah, the atmospheric stability classes, the Pasquil classes there uh, via uh, power laws, and again, I'm not going to talk about them, but I'll leave one interesting thought with you. Um, you need quite careful meteorological data to use these models. So you need what's called a wind speed direction frequency distribution. And what that is, is basically it's an annual, maybe over 10 years or 15 years, summary of uh, each direction the wind blows from, how often it does, and how hard it is in each of those directions. So you have a grid with wind speed across the top, wind direction down the side, and it's uh, basically a frequency table. You need to think about the concept of mixing height, and that's uh, plumbed into the Pascal stability classes. And then think of applications. I'm quite proud of myself in one sense. Um, I actually modeled air quality in mediev the medieval city of York and in Victorian, uh, um, in Wales, where there were some big mines, uh, uh, metal refining mines, and I, I, I did the work there. But you can apply these things, provided you don't want real-time actual data. You know, at five o'clock this afternoon, the concentration was, these models are not very good at that. They're good at long-term average data. And even though there are modern versions of these models, now the breeze models and things like that, which are used for regulatory purposes, if you want to build a, a chimney, you have to do this plume dispersion modeling, and it's all very impressive. 
remember you're not playing to the strengths of plume dispersion models when you're trying to use them to predict daily or real time. Their best strength is long term average. OK, and enough of the rant. Final slide. So this is using these models. If zero is the um, uh, where your chimney is going down away from the chimney, this is particular one direction, this is downwind. These are typically the uh, predicted sulfur dioxide concentrations in this case uh, at a distance downwind. So four kilometers downwind of the chimney if the wind speed is maybe one meter per second uh, with whatever is coming out of the chimney. You obviously know that you've modeled it. Maybe you've got um, uh, 50 micrograms per cubic meter of sulfur dioxide. So this is one of the things you can get out of these models and you can see why if you want to build a chimney this sort of modeling is useful. This is the other thing uh, you can get out of it which is effectively your grid. So these are you've not still got the grid squares here but effectively these are the grid squares and here now you're seeing the entire annual average concentrations taking in all of the different wind speeds at the frequency they blow. So here you can see uh, wherever this place is, the wind blows, uh, it's near Liverpool, the wind blows from the uh, predominantly the southeast or the northwest. Uh, there's a small amount of wind from the uh, southwest and a small amount of wind from the uh, northeast. Okay, I think probably I've said all I want to say, so uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much and uh, goodbye.